This is Star Talk. Neil deGrasse Tyson here, your personal astrophysicist. We're doing cosmic queries. Cosmic queries today. And you know I can't do that without Chuck Nice. Chuck, how you doing, man? Hey, Neil. What's happening, buddy? Yeah, yeah. Guess you guess who we have as a as a as a guest today. I'll play along, even though I can see her on the screen right now. <laughs> you can see her. Uh, who, who, who could that be? Who could that be? She's our resident Cosmo chemist. Yes. Now, how many people get to say that? Nobody gets. We no, get to say that. No, yeah. Not even the people who work at Cosmo get to say that they're a Cosmo chemist. <laughs> That's... Natalie Starkey, thanks for coming back to Star Talk. No, Talk. no problem. I love to be here. I want to chat. I want to chat cosmic chemistry, always. Oh, my gosh. That's your professional expertise. And, you know, people don't think that the universe involves other fields, right? Uh, you start out as a geologist. Right. And, of course, there's geology on rocky planets. Um, and then right. you want to know what the chemistry is. You, mm -hmm. We got to tap people who've got these kind of expertise. And you're just that kind of person. Yeah, it, uh, plugs one field into another. Well, I, I never realized stuff. myself, you know, when I started out, I just liked rocks, I liked volcanoes, and then, you know, slowly you start to learn more, and then you realize, of course, all the planets are made of rock, and so you get to start doing geology in space and looking at chemistry in space. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it just, and then you get cooler names like cosmochemistry. So. Now, what, what happens when you encounter a gas giant? Are you, like, foiled again? Yeah, no, no, yeah see, I know. No, right. that's your no. bias. <laughs> Wait, Chuck, didn't you hear that bias? Well, planets are made of rock. No, that's what made me. That's what made me say it. I heard that. I heard it. Well, you know, planets are rocky. I'm like, hmm, really, really, Natalie. That's just a bias. I do much prefer the rocky ones. Okay. <laughs> we we can give Natalie a hall pass on the bias there. That's fine. If if all planets are rocky to to a, a cosmochemist, then I'm okay with that. So so uh, Natalie, of late, you were with the Royal Society of Chemistry. Yeah, and I that's guess that's correct. in London. Is that um, correct? It's uh, based in London, also in Cambridge, just outside London. In mm. Cambridge, okay. And you're a writer and science communicator with them. Um, you've written two of my favorite books that are out there: oh, Fire oh and Ice, God. The Volcanoes of the Solar System. We did a whole Ooh. show on that. Yes, we did. We, did. we talked about yep. ice volcanoes. Oh yes. my gosh, that yep. was fun. And uh, a book a few years before that, back to, in 2018. Catching Stardust, yeah. comets, asteroids, and the birth of the solar system. Yeah, That's exactly. why we have you on now, there because the space mission OSIRIS-REx is bringing back samples from an asteroid. Yeah. And so, was it a comet? Which, so, so we, we want to, first, people have asked questions about this, but, but I'm not going to go to it until I'm done with you, okay? Okay. So, <laughs> I'm not done with you on this. So- uh, Osiris Rex, that's an acronym. So what do you, do you remember what it stands for? Oh, it's like, yes. Uh, it's like some maybe optical, spectral, uh, regolith, explorer, or something like that. There's a really long name. Um, I, I was worried you were going to test me on that because no, okay. <laughs> no one ever asked that. It's, it, it's yeah. always... Oh, it's well, well, I got it here in my notes. I just found it in my notes. You ready? It's, it's very forced, I mm -hmm. might add. Okay. Go ahead. Origins, spectral interpretation, resource identification, and security regolith explorer. Oh, that's ridiculous. I knew, I knew that's, that. that's, that's, ridiculous. that's ridiculous. <laughs> Somebody said, I want to name it Osiris. Get us there. <laughs> that's that's how that happened. It's I want to name it Osiris. I've heard. It's not the worst. There's there's been yeah, we, we do like to make nice space uh, things like juice, I think was is my favorite, but um yeah, the juicy moon. It, it, it doesn't even work, but you know, we like nice names in space. Right. You want so it could be easy, but uh, yeah, okay. So so this uh, this mission went to the asteroid Bennu. Yeah. Bennu. Mm. And that's an that's an earth crossing asteroid if memory serves. Correct? Yeah. It is. Oh, you it, say that so calmly. It is. <laughs> yeah. There's loads of them. Yeah. 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 No. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's a possibility that we might bump into one another one day. Just, you know. <laughs> Well, this right, is precisely so, why we're looking at them because, you know, there's these, there are a lot of what we call near Earth asteroids. Um, and right. they're sort of in this Earth environment space within, within you know, this sort of similar orbits or it could be Earth crossing in the future. Bennu just takes about just over a year to go around the sun. And about every, I think it's every five or six years, it comes fairly close to our planet. But 
for the next, say, 100 years, it's not really thought to be a problem. It's, uh, we, we, it's not going to hit us. But there, there is the potential in uh, maybe, I think they're saying 2182 or something. Yeah, to November 2182, yeah. Uh, there is the possibility that it could collide with us. Now, obviously, don't expect any of us to be around by then unless uh, medical technology improves dramatically between now and then. Wait, wait, wait. Natalie, you can't say it that way. You can't say... Adults might strike Earth in 2180. We're not going to be around, so well, yeah, not to yeah. worry. Guess no. what? <laughs> hey, you know what? I got a feeling my grandchildren are going to be, you know, kind of a-holes anyway. So <laughs> guess what? <laughs> guess what? what? They get what right. they deserve. Okay, so so Natalie, just help us out here. Because the headlines say this same asteroid that we sample collected is may hit Earth in 2182. And then I looked at the likelihood of it hitting earth and the probability is around one in 3000 mm -hmm. you know lo, so, now listen that doesn't sound insignificant one in 3000 those are better odds than you get in many in games the lottery. and, the, and <laughs> definitely better lot, odds than the lottery so yeah. what level do they say it may hit versus won't likely hit is there a boundary between the those two The problem is there's, there's a few little things you have to unpick here. And part of it is that actually the, we need to go up and study these objects to understand exactly what the orbit's going to be. So at this moment in time, we can give it that probability that it, it will hit Earth. But wow. as we get closer to that date, we refine these figures. So it may get like higher possibility that it's going to hit Earth, but it may go down. And that is often what happens. One of these things we're trying to understand is called the Yarkovsky effect. And this is the effect that the sun, the heat of the sun has on an object orbiting around the sun. And, and it's quite, it's not a new phenomenon, but it's something new that we're kind of studying in detail, understanding how that's going to affect the orbit. So basically it heats up maybe one side of the asteroid more than the other and creates more of a spin. And therefore, it can very slightly change the orbit of that object over time. But that phenomenon is quite hard to predict. So we have to study the object more to understand how it's going to change in the future. So, so what so that is would the depend difference? Well, I'm sorry. I'm just curious here. If the heating is the same as when they refer to solar winds, or would that be a different phenomenon? And does that have any effect on it, the radiation of the sun itself, not just the heat? Yeah, there's different effects. So yeah, there's there's uh, there's another well-known effect, and it's another starts with another Y. So you've got you definitely have different effects that happen to the objects in space as they go around the sun. The, there's other things, for example, as uh, for example of comet. Well, isn't there uh, a Yarkovsky effect? Yarkovsky, yeah. Um, that's is that the one you just talked about, or is that yeah, the one you were that, trying to remember? Yeah, that's the one I've just spoken about. But there's other things like if you take a, an object with a lot of water in, so there's a lot of ice and water in comets and, and asteroids sometimes, um, as they go close to the sun and that water evaporates off or sublimates away, that also affects the orbit of that object because obviously it's getting smaller and it, it's, it's shedding material all the time. So these are active environments. These rocks are not just sitting in space, just sitting there as a rock. They're changing as every time they orbit the sun. And that's something, that's one of the reasons we go to study them in space. Because if we get up close to them, we can see exactly what they're doing. We can see what they're made of, what shape they are, and, and what is sitting on their surface that's going to affect all of these things. And, and then we can kind of refine our thoughts about whether they're going to collide with us in the future. Yeah, it's it's, it's kind of like predicting a storm in a meteor, like a meteorologist, like, you know, eight or 12 days out. Who knows what the path of the storm is? But then as we get closer, we know, okay, yeah, once again, Florida, you're doomed. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, so, so what, we, what we're saying here then is if you didn't have all these extra effects, we would know the orbit precisely. Yeah. Right? And yeah. then we, we, it would either hit us or not hit us. Mm -hmm. There wouldn't be a chance of either. It would just be... A it binary kind of understanding. Yeah, we probably know exactly where it was going to hit. But, you know, this is a 500 meter wide object. So in terms of things that you can get in space. Speak American, small. Natalie. Oh, Speak no, don't American. try me to compare. I have no idea Jesus what that is. Jesus Christ, 500 meters. I'm like, okay, how many football fields is that? Okay, I, I don't, don't know. do football fields. I do swimming pools. So let's take an Olympic size swimming pool. You know, it takes me a while to get down an Olympic size swimming pool. They're about 50 meters. So it's it's 10 of these end to end. Okay. So don't ask about football fields. Don't have a clue. It's it's a really big object, but in terms of space, that's quite small, obviously, compared to a planet. Um, so if this 
were to collide with our planet and if it were to make it all the way to the surface without breaking up on the way in through you know atmospheric entry if it made it as a block to the surface it would probably create about a six mile wide crater or more um and so we're talking about kind of localized damage it's not going to be like earth shattering earth changing you know the whole globe is not going to change extinction um, level right, yeah, right. it's extinction not one of these level. massive uh, after ones. it hits uh morgan freeman won't have to come out and comfort us all <laughs> right yeah <laughs> He could do that. You never know. I'd still want him to do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yes, but another issue, of course, if it hits the ocean, then you could have tsunamis that would totally yeah. terrify coastlines. Probably doing more damage than if it just hit land, is my guess. Uh, yeah, yeah. Would, I mean, would you agree? Yeah, I think it would be really hard. I mean, obviously, if it hits somewhere in, you know, somewhere very remote, that's going to have less of a effect than if it hits New York City, which is usually what they use in the movies, isn't it? It's always New York <laughs> for some reason. <laughs> right, of course. Right, right, right. So, um, okay, so now, yeah. now, now, Natalie, before we continue this podcast, I want you to promise me that NASA going to Bennu to bring back samples didn't affect its orbit such that it's now going to hit Earth. Wow. Promise well, me that. Oh, man. Oh, that would be bad, wouldn't it? Because they how is it like, that oh, we, go to, we go to an asteroid, <laughs> wow. and then all of a sudden we have headlines that asteroid might hit Earth. So now yeah. you're going to promise me NASA right. had nothing you're to do right. with that. Let's, let's not make that link. Let's not, let's not expose <laughs> them. Uh, no, but do you know what? That... It's funny to say that because that is actually a way that we could think about redirecting these objects. And there was a mission called DART, which is the Double Asteroid Redirection Test. That right. that acronym works. I like that one. Yes, that um, totally and works. And they, they did this just a couple of years ago. They they basically put an impact, a kinetic impact into the side of a very small asteroid called Didymus. And they changed its orbit very slightly. So we've proven, or NASA have proven, and Anissa are working on this project, that you can move an asteroid if you want to. If you've got enough time, you can change its orbit. Orbit. So actually, you can do that. But just to be, just to clarify, we changed its orbit around its its host asteroid. Yeah, right? so it, it was, was a binary asteroid. Yeah, it was That's like a, double a asteroid. baby asteroid on a, right, next exactly. to a big asteroid. Because it's it's hard because that orbit is very well determined, right? Mm. right. You can time that. It's a, just an orbit around an, ast an asteroid moonlit orbiting an asteroid. Yeah. So. Um, so that made for a very uh, 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 reliable um, scenario to test what, what effect you had. Yeah. Exactly. And we weren't endangering anybody if it went kind of a little bit wrong um, because you don't want things to go a little bit wrong and then redirect something into an earth crossing orbit. But, you know, we've, right. we've tested that technology and that is what we could use in the future. But one of the things you've got to also remember is that all of these objects are completely different to each other. So um, Bennu, for example, is what's known as a rubble pile asteroid. So it's not like a big lump of just solid rock. It's actually made up of lots of little and bigger pieces, maybe boulders up to 10 meters in size. And again, a fifth of a football field um and uh, and smaller pieces that are all kind of held together but it's not it's not like a solid solid piece of rock so if you were to push a kinetic impactor into the side to try and nudge it out of the way onto a different orbit it might be that it broke up instead of you know just just moved slightly which might be worse you then have more pieces so these experiments are very important to establish yeah, very the important to understand what integrity yeah. of the object oh. now Precisely. if it's so loosely held together i mean that would affect the way that it breaks up when it hits the Earth's atmosphere as well, yeah. too. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so, uh, ex yeah, this, there's so many sort of, I don't want to call them unknowns because they're, they're knowns, but um, we don't know exactly how it would react. And, and if, you know, parts within the internal parts of it are held together better, would that maintain itself? Or, you know, if bits are flying off and as it comes in, it's very hard to know. Um, and it, literally every asteroid is different. So, you know, we have a lot of unknowns that we're just like, okay, we just have to wait and see. Natalie, I'm old enough to remember when this was first discovered, where people, the, the first measurements of the density of some asteroids, and these are rocky asteroids, and they measured the density, and the density was less than the density of rocks. Yeah. So how can you have a rocky ast a, a rock asteroid where its density is less than that of rock? And people say, wait a minute, maybe it's a collection of rocks, and there's like, Pockets. and there's... 
yeah, pockets of whatever exactly. that's not rock. Yeah. So that the overall density is less. And it was, then we just call them rubble piles, I think. Yeah. So. And you've got, you know, you've got other components in there too. You've got different types of ices, not just water ice. You've got other um, elements of ice and you've got, yeah, you've got pore space in there. Um, so yeah. they're, they're incredibly complicated objects. And there's a whole, you know, you've got extreme end members, all ice and all rock and then everything in between. Um, so yeah, th this is why we need to study them in space to get up close. You can't get this information really with a telescope. You've got to be in orbit around these objects um, with, you know, advanced cameras to have a look at the surface in detail. So uh, this sample it is arriving now. Okay? Yeah. And so what, uh, it'll be a while before we uh, get to analyze it. We, those who, who of course, it's their mission. Uh, what do you expect to find? Yeah. You're, so you're a, geo, you're a geochemist. So why don't you just be ordinary geochemical things that you'd expect? Yeah, I, I guess the thing is, we're not going to expect to find anything, I'm going to say alien, there's nothing alien in it. We know kind of what we expect to find, but there will be interesting things that we will be able to confirm along the way. So they expected to collect, they wanted to collect about 60 grams of rock. Um, I think that's two ounces, maybe. I'm, I'm yeah, trying two to ounces. do mm -hmm. very quick um, math. That's two ounces. Yeah. Um, but mm -hmm. they actually think they've collected quite a bit more. Now, until they open that canister, um, which lands in the Utah desert, and they're going to collect it and, and take it back to the Johnson Space Center... Um, until they open that canister, they don't know exactly how much they got. They think they might have up to a kilogram of rock in there, which is absolutely phenomenal. That's so much rock. Um, and actually, the kind of work that I used to do was on these kind of rocks. And I was always working on literally tiny, tiny pieces of dust. And the amount of detail we can get out of that piece of dust of a comet or an asteroid is, is phenomenal. So the fact they've got a kilogram potentially is going to be absolutely amazing for the sample analysis community. Wait, wait, wait. So how is it that they were after two ounces and might have gotten a kilogram? 2.2 2 pounds. How do you accidentally, how do you accidentally set your standards low, times? right? And then you always achieve, you know? It's better to overachieve. I think the problem was um, they didn't know necessarily what the surface was going to look like till they got there. And and this um, is always the same with these missions. It was the same with the Rosetta mission that went to Comet Churyov Gerasimenko, that 67p um they didn't know what to expect until they got there and then they've got to land on this thing well Osiris Rex didn't land exactly it did what we call a touch and go so it kind of uh dropped down to the surface um it, it has this uh instrument called the tag sam which was collecting the rock and it blew nitrogen onto the surface and and, and that kind of uh, blew up rock into the capsule and so they just didn't know how much they were going to get because that depended if they were landing on a piece of solid rock or dusty oh, material or it, what it might be it, okay. obviously when they they mapped the object first so they did all this amazing you know that the whole object was mapped and the cameras got an image of every single part of it when they saw a big 10 meter boulder they were like well we're not going to land there because we're not going to be able to pick up a 10 meter boulder we need to land somewhere where it looks a bit finer grained and we can pick up materials so wow. that had to be very carefully mapped out before they did that sample analysis but yeah hopefully wow. they've got quite a bit in there Okay, so so Natalie, you were previously involved in sample return missions, but just not this one. Which ones were you involved in? Yeah, so I've been really lucky to work on um, initially the Stardust mission, which was the first sample return mission from a comet or asteroid, um, and it, it went to an asteroid. And uh, oh, sorry, it went to a comet. What am I talking about? Um, and and this wasn't landing on the comet. What they did was flew through the tail of the comet. So this comet was just going around the sun materials flying off the back the whole time and they had what they call a tennis racket style collector that kind of popped up off the off the spacecraft and the particle just flew into that and they collected them at high speed as high speed impacts and they brought that capsule back um and then Wait, didn't we that use aerogel it did yeah so i love wow. that stuff we had a lot of aerogel yeah. in the lab i have a little, and... have a little sample of it here right, I got it's it right amazing here stuff it's really and because it's yeah. it is so light i keep aerogel on my desk the really cool thing about it is that it it decelerates the particles. So they were coming in at the speed of a, a speeding bullet, I think six kilometers per second or something. So you need to be able to decelerate those particles without destroying them. Because obviously, if you decelerate something very quickly, it's going to heat up. And therefore, you've got all this really exciting carbon material in these comet particles and, you know, bits and bobs of whatever is in there. You don't want to destroy that by heating it all up and volatilizing everything. So that aerogel was amazing at kind of slowing things down and collecting and, and keeping mm -hmm. those particles. It's mm -hmm. quite then hard to get the particles out of the aerogel. So that was part of the sample analysis. It took a long time to process um, the collector. But um, yeah, so I got to work you, on those. You could samples. have used cotton candy. Just letting you guys yeah. know. <laughs> uh, 
It might have worked. You never yeah, know. Just a bit sticky. And then all you would have had to do was wet it, and you would have had everything. <laughs> everything would have been right there. And so before we go to questions, I just let me just give a shout out to my people here who will launch a mission <clears throat> from Earth, a moving platform, do a touch and go on an asteroid, itself a moving platform, return to Earth, and have it land in the Utah desert. Yeah. Okay? We And know this. And you have people walking among us say, I don't trust science. I don't need to die. Excuse me? Do you see what we're accomplishing here? And it's not finished. That that mission's continuing now, actually. It's going to go. So it, it, this, the, it's dropped off the sample capsule, so it comes back to Earth. And now the spacecraft continues on to another asteroid. So it's going to cost what? a bit more money, but because wow. it's still working and all the instruments are working, it's going to go to Apophis, I think it's called. Apophis. Apophis. Um, Apophis. Yeah, Apophis. which is That's another, another asteroid. Crosser. And yeah. yeah, and so we're going to study that and get some more. We're not going to get any samples because that's done now, but we can study it with all the other scientific instrumentation and see what, wow. what it looks like. So okay. yeah, that's really exciting. All right. Do you expect to find organics at all? Yeah, definitely. So Bennu is um, it's a, a C type asteroid, which so it's carbonaceous, so it's got lots of carbon in. It's actually a, a, a B type, so within that, it's a, it's got even more carbon within it. So it's thought to be what we call a very primitive asteroid, which means that we think it's um, it's left over from the very birth of the solar system. It's got the the very first materials that were formed around the sun. And these are the kind of objects where we found amino acids, right? Precisely. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, we fully expect to find amino acids in there um they should be there they, they've been found in in all the other um sample return missions we've done from comets and asteroids so far the um, building blocks of proteins in the building yeah and building i mean the hayabusa 2 mission which um did a similar thing and came back just a couple years ago the analysis have been have been ongoing for that they've even found one of the nuclear bases of rna so we've got so much exciting Whoa. information in there Whoa. um i think it's uracil Whoa. is that how it's pronounced I, i'm not a biologist but is it, it is it a battery I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but it's in there. So you've got, yeah, you've got all the building blocks for life within these objects. And that's part of the reason we want to look at them. We, what we really want is something to crawl out of it when we open it up. That would okay. be very cool. And you know, <laughs> it, it would be just, it's trapped in the capsule. Or, or so we what we should know. do. Okay. And Natalie, I'm older than you. I remember in real time, I read the book. Rare for me to read a book before I see the movie. But I did that for the Andromeda strain of Michael Crichton. Before he was famous with Jurassic Park oh. and and whatever his doctor show was on TV, uh, the Andromeda strain was a sample return from space, and it was a bug that got out of the capsule, and and I uh, it, it didn't bode well <laughs> for the town <laughs> where the capsule landed. Well, watch out for Texas then, because that's where the sample's going. So, oh, uh... Texas, not Utah. We're... Uh, it's landing in Utah, and then it's going to go to uh, Johnson Space Center. So, yeah. oh, gotcha, gotcha, right there, gotcha. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, All right, Chuck, give me some questions for this geochemist here. All right, let's, uh, let's jump to it. Well, we might as well start with Paul Cinema, and thank you, Paul, for the phonetic spelling of your name. Uh, it says, hey, Natalie, Neil, Chuck, Paul here from the Netherlands. Each time the Apollo astronauts returned from the moon, they had to go into isolation because of the fear of bringing back something bad from the moon. Ha, huh? look at that, Neil. Uh, when we bring <laughs> pieces of asteroid back to Earth, do we not run the same risk, and is there any protocol? Yes, um, there's protocols both ways because when we send, uh, you know, Earth materials into space, we want to make sure they're not contaminated with anything from Earth that's going to then put it into, you know, onto Mars, onto the moon or onto an object in space so, because we want to check that we're not, you know, taking some bugs there and then saying, oh, look, we found these bugs on this object. Look how cool this is. So that's one thing. So it, that's called planetary. So in other um, words, you don't want anybody sneezing on the spacecraft before it goes to you exactly. Know, getting a rhino virus. We found rhino viruses on Mars. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah, no. Okay. And this is one of those problems when you get meteorites landing. So meteorites come from these space objects and land on on our planet, um, but they've come through our atmosphere. They've sat on the ground for a while. So there's that you know 
there's every expectation that they could have been contaminated with Earth things. But when you go to an asteroid and collect stuff directly and put it in a clean capsule and bring it back, and then you take it back to a lab to open it, you know that anything you find within there in that clean lab environment, and I've worked in these labs in the Johnson Space Center, they are incredibly clean. They're very hard to get into because you've got to go through this whole procedure and you've got to wear masks and a full hood and suit and everything. So you want to make sure that you're protecting the sample from you so that you're, you know, and, and it's gone even more extreme when people have been building space missions. They, you know, I remember one guy had a beard. He had to shave his beard off because they just said, we can't deal with your beard. It's too dirty. We have to get rid of your beard. Otherwise you can't go in the clean lab. So this is, you know, it's this level like of cleanliness. Or whatever. That, yeah. yeah. It's like, I mean, However yeah, much that, washing, it, it's got to be gone. Um, so yeah, that we. Uh, that sounds nasty. I guess there Sorry, is that. Sorry, Davey, you're a slob. Okay, <laughs> that's all there is to it. You're disgusting, and there's food in your beard. Okay, <laughs> so you're gonna have to shave that puppy. <laughs> All right. But yeah, when we bring stuff back, sure, potentially, you know, we could have things crawling out of that. It's very unlikely. But um, we have dedicated labs for the return missions. So there's nothing else in those labs. We're only dealing with those samples and they go into special airlocks. That's what they said about Andromeda strain. Well, That's you know, <laughs> we know what by we're the way, doing. They're all sterile. Each level below ground was a different, a higher level of sterilization oh, for you okay. as you went down. And you only worked on it at the lowest level there. And they even burned off your outer skin layer. Oh, my God. It has all these microbes. <laughs> oh, my God. You, you walk through some UV <laughs> thing, and then just they wipe the skin off. So, That's no, terrifying. it's a fascinating. Michael Crichton wrote it. The, the boy has an a, a MD. So okay. he knew what he was doing. It was, it was a fun, terrifying story, the Andromeda strain. That's cool. So I'm going to watch that. I'm going to watch that while your people open this. <laughs> just thought I'd tell you that. Okay. <laughs> By the way, how does it land? Oh, it, it's got basically is a capsule and it comes down with parachutes, um, hopefully. Oh, okay. No, it's like uh, an and then it, it capsule. plonks itself into the desert somewhere, um, okay. hopefully in a d predictable location. But yeah, I mean, there are issues sometimes, that, you know, the parachutes don't open. That has happened before with a, um, a capsule that came back from collecting samples of the sun, believe it or not. Um, and it actually crashed and the capsule got a bit broken but they did manage to sort of actually collect samples still that that wasn't Man. pieces of rock that were collected in that by the way stuff. chuck that, i remember that, the pictures of it <clears throat> that that was not so much a capsule it, it looked like a flying saucer mm. it was like saucer shaped uh -huh. and it like it was an angle into the ground it ah. looked just like a crash flying like saucer. a like a like an alien ship hmm. yeah right, exactly yeah. So i gotta maybe... tell you who Whoever was in charge of parachutes had to get fired. Okay, <laughs> I mean, serious. It's like billion dollars we spent, and we skipped, we skimped on the parachutes. Seriously. <laughs> all right. Wow. So, all right. So, yeah. So, so Natalie, correct me if I'm wrong. At NASA, it's the department. I don't know. There's a department, the Division of Planetary Protection. That's yes. what it's called, right? Yeah. Oh. Right, so it protects both ways. Yeah. Forward contamination and back contamination. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You got it. Okay. Okay. Right, Chuck, what more you got? Hey, this is Andy C. from Vancouver, British Columbia. He says, what are some of the unique challenges working on asteroids due to their minimal or negligible gravity? I assume it's pretty close to just working in microgravity of space for mm. most of them. Yeah. Or, or may I, am I wrong? Yeah. Right, completely right. I mean, uh, Bennu is the smallest object or the smallest asteroid to um, have been investigated in detail. Um, and as I said, it's 500 meters, uh, which doesn't sound very small, but it is really, really small. So, how much would you weigh on Bennu? See, that's what we were. Really uh, you wouldn't. Know. You wouldn't stick to the surface at all. You'd be flying off. So, you know, if if you wanted to land an object on Bennu, you would need to, or if you wanted to stand there, you'd need to be tethered down, um, because you would, if you okay. just jumped, you'd fly away. Um, which was an issue with the Rosetta mission. It, when it it did land on uh, the comet, uh, and it bounced initially because you know it didn't quite go to plan there were a few things went wrong there was something broken on the spacecraft and they knew it was broken there was nothing they could do at that point it attempted landing but they then had these tethers that came out and kind of attached it to the surface and that was the plan but um in terms of osiris rex um when you go into orbit around these objects we call it orbit but it's not really because there's not enough gravity to be uh, gravity to be pulling that spacecraft towards it so it's really powered flight around these objects it's not as easy as going to mars and just orbiting around it's it's you're orbiting 
but it's not an orbit that is caused by the object itself. It's, it, yeah, right, it's, right, it's right, powered right. flight, and it's a lot more complicated for the mathematicians. They've got to figure out all that um, whilst you know not hitting the surface and not getting too far away. Right. Well, what else um, are they going to do? Give them, well, give them exactly. Yeah. Something to do. <laughs> they They're not in the lab. <laughs> They're not it. Just give them a pencil and a pad, and uh, give you know, them a pencil and a napkin. <laughs> tell, them, <laughs> tell them go work this out so okay so what you're saying is on earth escape velocity is like seven miles per second uh, 11 meters per second okay no no 11 kilometers you. per second right uh so you're you're saying that on these smaller asteroids just your if you just trotted hmm. you would be lifting yourself up with enough speed to possibly escape the asteroid yeah yeah because that's how low the escape velocity is yeah it's a whole other dynamic. What is it? It's Armageddon, things. isn't it? Where Bruce and Bruce and what's his face go up to the asteroid and start mining it and stuff. Um, is that the movie? Yeah. yeah, yeah and... Well, yeah, yeah. Well, well, they don't mine it. He's a miner. He's a um, miner, I mean, he and mines, they're trying I mean, to drill into it. Oil. Yeah, he drills in. But they do have these grappling hooks. Yeah. They, so they, they, they did give some sensitivity. To they, the lower yeah, they, that was where mm-hmm. you know there was a, a lot of inaccuracies in that movie. But there we go. They they you were think? on the yeah, so, <laughs> think? <laughs> within the first maybe two minutes. But anyway, um, but yeah, so you, it's something you would have to think about if you wanted to go and mine these objects. You've you've got to tether yourself on there. Um, but with Osiris Rex, it, it didn't land. It, it did this touch and go, so it, it wasn't really a problem. It, it actually used that. That wasn't a problem for it because it could get away. And, and by the way, uh, famously noted in Armageddon. The, the asteroid that Bruce Willis had to destroy was the size of Texas. So that would certainly have a noticeable ah, gravity. Ah, okay. Yeah. yeah, that's quite, that would be a lot. It's a line yeah. delivered in the film. I know every line in the film, and that's yeah. how that, where that happened. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, Armageddon violates more laws of physics per minute Ooh. than any other film I had ever seen until I saw Moonfall. <laughs> During oh COVID. my god, <laughs> oh poor we, Halle Berry's, you know Halle Berry. Yeah, the moon is like turned it is discovered to be hollow, How right? Like a moon, a moon creature it, inside made of. I rock. have not seen this. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just get ready, strap yeah. yourself in for that okay. one. Yeah, Halle Berry I bought just, a uh, bought bought a summer house and was like, "Damn it, I got to do a movie." So. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so keep going, ball. truck. All right, here we go. Uh, this uh, next question. Gr- greetings to the Royal Court of Cosmology. Ooh, so I, o- o- Osiris I like Rex took a bite out of an asteroid, and I wonder what it tastes like. Seriously, though, is it at all cost effective to mine an asteroid, and how would it be processed? Uh, should it be sliced like deli meat, ground like burgers? What would the wheat be separated from the chaff? Oh my goodness. Dave in Montague, New Jersey, wants to know. Dave, oh. very, very poetic, Dave. I just love that. Oh. Dave's being very poetic. When we separate the wheat from the chaff, <laughs> what exactly shall we find on the floor like of the cosmological trio? Yeah. Exactly. Oh, that's brilliant. Oh, that question's got me. Okay. Um, yes. Okay. So mining asteroids, sure. It, it would be profitable if we wanted to do it. Um, but there's just loads of economic Im- implications of doing it. So the asteroids contain tons of precious metals. Brilliant. We need tons of precious metals for all the technology we need on Earth, particularly, you know, car batteries now need tons of precious metals. Wait, 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 wait the carbon ones don't, just the me- metallic asteroids, right? Yes, but they, they still contain quite a bit of uh, siliceous material. So they will have other bits and bobs. But yeah, you'd go to the Salacious right asteroids. Siliceous materials? Sil- yeah, yeah, what, silicious, like silicate. To silicate. Uh, <laughs> silicate. Oh, I was going to say, are you... You talking salacious. about sexy asteroids now? <laughs> well, oh, that are, asteroid's very salacious, I have to tell you. <laughs> but okay. yeah, you'd go to the right ones, and there's plenty of them up there. Um, and and so when you've got a metal-rich asteroid, um, it's going to be pretty solid. It's going to be harder to mine than like a rubble pile. But there are ways to do it. We we have really have the technology to do it. Um, the big, the big question is you've invested all that money, you could then potentially bring all of those metals back to earth and you would literally flood the market. So if you would have a lot of money, but then we would uh, basically wouldn't need any more ever again, um, potentially. However, that's not a, such a bad thing because mining is extremely deleterious to the ecology and to, yeah. you know, the, the structure uh, of, of, uh, you know, of, of our ecological balances. And so to be able to go someplace and bring it back. Space mining. Space mining. Space mining. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, you're, you're really doing a great deal of good, even though you would have 
cornered the market and kind of and collapsed the that sector of the economy. There's also <laughs> the thing, Other than that, everything is fine. fine. <laughs> but there's also technologies that we could develop if we had enough supply of certain metals. So some things are constrained at the moment because we just don't have the supply. So we couldn't say, oh, let's go make this amazing thing because we just don't have that. So it could be that we open up new technologies. So, so what you're saying is we would create industry, even though you're destroying one sector of the economy, you're creating a whole brand new area. Potentially, yeah. Potentially. So the initial investment is huge. Um, the risks could be huge as well. So what if something goes wrong? What if when one of these companies goes up and starts mining, something goes wrong, they redirect something by accident, ends Ooh. up colliding with Earth, you know, or Mars or something else. So we don't want to, that to happen. Um, so there's a lot of regulation that would be required. But, there, you know, there's companies working on this. There's a lot of investment happening. And it, I think it will happen one day. But, but to, to your point, Natalie, the asteroids of interest would be the nearest ones, which are the Earth crossers, right? I mean... But as a category of asteroid, those are the easiest ones to get to. Yeah. So the, the thought that a mistake could direct it towards Earth is very real. But if they're up there messing with asteroids, I might say, if I'm the president, I'll say, we discovered an asteroid headed our way. Could you go to that one and deflect it, you know, out of, out of harm's way? And so if they have the power to get to asteroids and mess with them. They might be our biggest defense system. Right. Yeah. They could they, they they have a dual purpose. So let me ask you when when you identify these asteroids, are there any that have many metals in them? So like instead of just one precious like or you know, rare earth element uh or rare space element, would there be several? Is is that possible? Yeah, completely. I, in fact, yeah, the ones that contain metal contain a lot of different metals. So they'll tend to be, the really metallic ones will be iron and nickel that, on the most part, which is the same as sort of the core of our planet, which is what we think is down there. And that's the reason we think we know what's down there because we've looked at these very metallic asteroids and we think that's the center of, of a big object. And by the way, I want to interject, iron and nickel are the major byproducts of supernova explosions. There's a variety of supernova where iron and nickel, it, it comes right out. And so there's no shortage of iron and nickel We've in the got universe tons of that. for that so, reason. And it falls to the middle of things yeah. when, you know, when they're, they're molten and they form. So, so we get the iron and nickel for free from exploding stars and, and the other elements as well. But the abundance of iron and nickel is huge in the universe just from astrophysical forces. It's huge. So that is the majority of it, but there's tons of it, as Neil said. Um, within that as well, there's all these other, like platinum and all these other palladium, whatever the metals are, that all the heavy metals that fall into the center of a planet or the center of an asteroid when it um, when it's a molten blob of, of lava, essentially. And then um, it, it segregates into as it cools down into heavy stuff in the middle and the lighter elements on the outside. So, the, so there's loads of stuff in there. And even if there's only like one weight percent of, platinum it's a huge object and that's still tons and tons and tons of platinum so right. it's plenty so yeah you've got everything in there um they're so nature objects. nature pre-sifted it yeah us. i was gonna say yeah, the, he the hard is. work is done yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> all right wow. Chuck, see if you can get a couple more in we only have okay. a couple more minutes here what do you have all right here we go hi dr starkey dr tyson mr nice malcolm from trinidad and tobago who holds the rights to the resources of Bennu and any other celestial bodies? The Outer Space Treaty of question. 1967 and the Space Act of uh, 2015 fall short in providing a clear answer to this question. Yeah, so no does doubt. anybody get to go up and just, you know, is it the Wild West up there? You just right. get up there and Some, uh, this is somewhat. plant a flag. And like there's so there's literally space lawyers now, which I thought was just the coolest thing ever. I was like, okay, so they're working on these problems. Um, and there's many of them. You know, you've got private companies getting involved in space exploration. You've got private companies taking tourists up into space. You've got, when they get there, who owns what they get? And exactly who can bring it back to Earth? What happens if something goes wrong? All of this. And, and how do, you know, space agencies collaborate with private companies? There is so much in space law to be figured out. And a lot of it isn't figured out at the moment. The 1967 treaty basically was saying that you can't use space as a kind of a weapon. You can't, it, it's got to be anything, any work that goes on in space has to be peaceful. Um, we've moved past that. We, we're beyond that now. Um, 
space is a busy place. We're launching satellites all the time. You've got lots of different people launching satellites. It's a busy place above our planet now. Um, and we've we've not kept up. So Space Law is always, it's running and it's trying to catch up with what's going on. At the moment, I believe, I believe the law from a couple of years ago was that, I think Obama maybe signed this through, that American citizens can own the bits of space they find. Um, and I think uh, Luxembourg has a similar rule. I'm not sure all the other countries have caught up yet, but there's, it's slowly. So this is like of... a homesteading kind of rule, right? Yeah. Where yeah. you, if you, if you get there first and you develop it, then you get to, but if you do something with it, that's, uh, I think in the homesteading, you have to make, it had to be economically viable. But the idea is that promoted, um, uh, ex, not exploration, it promoted settlements, right? If so, otherwise, what's your motivation to go there if you didn't have a return on that effort? And the return on that effort is you get the free land. You get to get is, the right. Mm, yeah, yeah, that was a. If mm. you're go so, yeah, there. it's a big it's a big area at the moment and um, constantly changing field. I can't say I'm up to date completely with it, but I'm just looking forward to the space wars because you know, oh, okay, once Chuck. once we okay. figure it, <laughs> once we figure out who's got what, you know, that means somebody else got to come along and be like, you know, I'm Vladimir Putin want, and I'm taking some. that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so one of my more interesting elements of space law that I read about was. If you meet an alien who's more intelligent than you and you kill it, is it murder? Yes. No, it's because double. murder it's, applies to humans. It's not. It's, it's beyond it's, murder. It's double murder. It's worse double. than murder. You actually <laughs> killed something better than you. That's ridiculous. That's like a fly. That's like a fly pulling out a. AK-47 and blowing the, <laughs> blowing us away. <laughs> a bunch of flies pulled the trigger on a gun. <laughs> it's ridiculous. That's terrible. Okay, Chuck wants to be a lawyer of the future. Okay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> All right. Keep going. Let's right. get, get, get two more. we got five minutes left. Two more. All right. Go. All right. Here we go. Let's get back to basics on this one. This is Matt from Perth, Australia. Hello, Dr. Tyson, Dr. Starkey, Lord Nice. How do you think asteroids are formed given you need mass to convert gas to solids like asteroids how could they form independently and not part of a planet or a star can they do that and let me uh, let me okay. add to that by saying and correct me if i'm wrong here natalie if you add up all the asteroids in the asteroid belt and if it's like five percent the mass of the moon yeah so that is. they don't like, actually yeah. have a planet's mass worth of content. No, so what, yeah. what, what, what the hell happened there? Whoa, whoa, yeah. They're just the kind of the leftover bits from when the solar system formed. Um, so you, you had a star that exploded and, 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 and you've got all this, this gas field around it in a cloud and it condenses down and then you start to form material around it. Now, it's a process that actually we don't really understand in a huge amount of detail because we've never seen it happen. We can now look at other star systems where planets are forming around them, but we're looking at these, you know, light years away. So do you, do you think Jupiter messed with the area so that it couldn't make its own planet? Because it, it's between Mars and Jupiter, and Jupiter's badass out there. Yeah, in the it, so there. Jupiter took a lot of the, the mass. It's very large because it's made of mostly gases, so it, it became very large. And the rocky planets became smaller because they've got all the denser material. But you had all this other material left over, which was the comets and asteroids. They they actually just didn't get incorporated into a planet, but that was quite good. It's useful for us because they're these sort of time capsules of that very early process, those very early times in our solar system, the first few million years, which sounds like a long time, I understand, but we're talking about 4.5 billion years of history. Um, they preserved those materials from that very early stage of star and planet formation. So that's why we want to analyze them partly, because they can tell us a bit about how the planets formed, how life got started, where life came from, and water. So that's part of the reason we want to look at them. Um, but yeah, there's, they've got a lot to tell us about those really early stages. And, and so an another dimension of this is, of course, you know, when the, the KT impact happened 65 million years ago, we think of that as an impact. But Natalie, do you think of that as just, oh, Earth is just gathering more mass from the bits and pieces? I mean, I also system. see it as like that that's something that completely changed the direction of life on Earth. You know, we probably wouldn't yeah. be here had that not happened. Right, right. Life in as we know it today might not have ever developed. It, it wiped out a lot of stuff, but some stuff survived and it creates a new you know, root for life to evolve. So um, it, it is just part of the process. It's part of the process of being a planet in space. Um, 
for sure we're going to be hit by an asteroid in the future hopefully we're going to know it's going to happen and we can do something about it but mm, yeah, chances are yeah. we're going to miss one um they're they're arriving all the time as meteorites but small pieces <laughs> oh, well, of rock. And, and that's you our know. show people thank you and <laughs> chances are we're going to miss sleep one well Natalie, sleep, sleep, come sleep on, well <laughs> i'm sorry and what you know what, what, what's, gonna miss what's, what's killing me is that we're hearing this from an expert. I like, you know, I know. What I mean? <laughs> it's, you know, let me just tell you. So I'm glad you're Dr. Natalie Starkey, Cosmo chemist, instead of Dr. Natalie Starkey, heart surgeon. Listen, <laughs> your heart is crap. You're going to die. OK, that's <laughs> that's it. That's it. It's all over. No, it's not that you said it. It's just you said it so casually. It's so yeah. casually. It's just, I, yeah, yeah, I we'll kind miss, of just we'll see Earth as like we, we're on this planet for maybe 100 years at best. And, you know, it's been here so long. And all these things have happened to this planet. And we're just this planet in space. And there's all these other planets. And, you know, I do get a bit of an existential crisis because I'm like, we're really not that important here. You know, we think we are. But right. actually, we're not really, are we? It's It's been here for ages. I, I don't. I don't think that means we shouldn't protect our planet and we shouldn't do things about climate change because there's still generations to come but we are going to have to deal with these things in the future um and hopefully i'm not ending on that note Chuck, okay. another question where we can more be positive happy. note <laughs> Chuck, well, give me the last question last, last question, question. And, okay. and natalie you're going to answer this in a positive spin Got it. okay go chuck okay here we go here we go um uh, uh, hello, Dr. Starkey. Can you please tell me, are we all going to die? Seriously? Is that the... <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> We're all going to die. Right. Okay. okay. Uh, this is uh, Kevin. He says, hello, Dr. Tyson. Lord, nice. Dr. Starkey. Kevin from Browning, uh, White Deer, Texas here. Uh, what can the sample from an asteroid reveal to us about the information of the solar system itself. Can it tell us anything about the origins of our life here on Earth? Yeah, Natalie, just because it has amino acids, why would that have to mean, if that can make amino acids, then so could Earth, right? So, so to, they say life might have come from asteroids, but maybe life could just happen anywhere. And it's just a, it's a curiosity, but it's not the, it's not the stork that brought the, the molecules. Yeah, so it's, it's we think uh, and we know that asteroids have the building blocks for life or many of them, um, but it's about then having the environment for life to form. So it's not just about having those building blocks. Life is pretty unlikely to form on an asteroid itself because we probably need water. We need some kind of liquid solvent that um, all these um, chemicals to move around in and, and form life. That's what we think is probably quite important. So the, the combination of water- But just to be clear, what you what you're implying there, and I just want to make it more graphic, is an atom or a molecule can't just get up and walk and find another molecule to yeah. bind with. Right. Okay? Yeah, it, it needs, needs some to medium. Yeah. It needs a medium that can carry it, so that it has these encounters and possibly explore the chemistry mm -hmm. that could result from it. Is that a fair characterization? Yeah, exactly. So yeah. early Earth was very inhospitable to life. It was very hot. It was molten. As it cooled down, it then condensed water on its surface. And we still were being impacted by asteroids from space. Now, these asteroids were containing these amino acids, these nuclear bases that we see, and all this carbon-rich material. So it might be that that is how life got to Earth, and, and then, you know, the building blocks for life. And then they had this lovely watery-rich environment where stuff could start forming. We got these oh, very so basic life forms. So that's one potential water that planet. did come. Yeah, we, we probably need water. And that's why when you look around the solar system, there isn't a huge amount of liquid water sitting around. And we don't, we haven't yet found life anywhere else. So that's why we sort of make that inference that we need, we need water, we think, for making life. Okay. All right. Well, that's there a good we go. note to end on, right, I think, Chuck. Go. Did you get your approval, that's Chuck, on that? I, I like that. I, I feel encouraged. <laughs> no, no, it's an important thing because I, I, yeah. I love that the, you can bring ingredients, but now you need you need the right environment yeah, and exactly. earth might have been just that. I love that. Yeah. Well, Natalie, it's been delight. Uh, we don't, we don't, we need to call you more often than we do. Oh, thank uh, you. Uh, and you have, uh, you have a unique sort of parameters of expertise that feed our mission here. And so thank you. And let me remind people that Natalie was uh, the author of one of our space shows here mm -hmm. in New York at the Hayden planetarium. So uh, we have a long relationship um, with this brilliant cosmo chemist oh, over there in the you. UK. I'll come All back right. anytime. Well, there it is, Natalie. We love you from over here across the pond. Thanks for helping us out uh, to Thanks understand this me. mission. Yeah. Uh, Chuck, good to have you, man. Always. Always a pleasure. 
All right, Neil deGrasse Tyson here signing off for Star Talk Cosmic Queries. As always, keep looking up. <laughs> <laughs>